So Gary Oringach, uh, in his article defending the use of animals in experimentation, which I think is generally a more careful defense of animal experimentation than Carl Cohen's, and takes greater pains to get um, <coughs> the positions of opponents correct, um, he also wants to do something similar here, but he says it's because of practical reasons. He says we need to make these broader general judgments, not judgments about individuals, because it's just not really practical. Well, of course, in some cases, it may not be practical to make um, individual judgments, because you've got to make a decision in a hurry. So take a case a bit like one that uh, Ringach talks about. Um, suppose you're driving along in a car and uh, a dog runs out into the road. And the only way you can avoid hitting the dog um, is to swerve. But then you see there's a child standing on the side of the road where you're going to swerve to. Well, obviously, you don't have time to Think about, um, is this, is this uh, a normal child who's living a good life, um, or is this perhaps a uh, profoundly disabled child who is not at an intellectual level any uh, equal to that of the dog, um, and uh, perhaps a child who doesn't have parents who care about them, so um, it would be better to hit the child than the dog. You can't, you can't uh, make that decision. You have to say, this is a child, Children normally uh, are going to have capacities greater than the dog, and uh, perhaps they're, they're going to cause more grief to their family if, if they're killed. So um, I can't swerve, because then I would hit the child. Um, unfortunately, I have no option but to hit the dog. Um, that's clear, I think, in that case. And, and in other cases you can think about, you do have to make decisions based on categories, um, based on what the overwhelming probabilities are, rather than based on individuals. But um, that's not going to be so in all cases. And certainly when you're planning research on animals, you have plenty of time to make those decisions. Uh, so you, know, you, you draw up plans for it. In fact, you, you submit applications for research grants. You submit applications to the Institutional Review Board to approve the ethics of it. So you've got plenty of time to consider uh, the beings that you're going to work with as individuals um, rather than as a type, rather than as a kind. So I don't see that you can use this as a justification for saying, as Ringach wants to say, we are justified in experimenting on animals, but we would not be justified in experimenting on human beings at a similar mental level to those animals. So if we're trying to deal with the objection that Bentham makes, or the argument from marginal cases, that if you're arguing that we're justified in experimenting on animals because they're at a lower mental level than humans are, that seems to imply that you would also be justified in experimenting on humans at the same mental level as the animals. So again, the those with severe intellectual disabilities. And if uh, yet experimenters uh, like uh, Ringach and Cohen don't want to say that, so I think they are in a difficult position there. They either have to simply say, well, I am discriminating on the basis of species, which Cohen perhaps is willing to say, but Ringach doesn't want to say, um, or uh, they're going to have to say it would be justified to use these humans um, if the law were changed to permit that or uh, um, if society was ready to accept that, uh, if there were useful experiments that could be done. You could, you could talk about some of those practical issues. But I think you would have to say, in principle, that would be justified. And it's interesting that uh, Ringach, who I think understands the issues pretty well, doesn't want to say that and instead comes up with this idea that it would, in practice, be difficult to do, which is one of the weak points in his article, uh, which I think is normally fairly careful, but here he doesn't really seem to uh, have a good answer to that question. 
so what does a utilitarian say about um, animal research? Um, Ringyak puts out this challenge. Um, he says the utilitarian ought to uh, ask the question, in fact, the relevant question, Ringyak says, whether animal research so far as a field has produced sufficiently important benefits to be justified. And Ringyak is confident that the answer is yes. Now, I honestly don't really know what the answer to that question is because it's a huge question. Um, if you say animal research as a field, you're talking about a vast range of experiments, a large number of which are not uh, the kind of medical research experiment on which Ringark focuses. They're not things like uh, providing treatments for major diseases that affect humans. Um, some of them are not medical at all. I'll, I'll get to one of those examples in a moment. Um, some of them are sort of quasi-medical, but are testing substances that we don't really need, like uh, simply practically every product that you use in the home, uh, cleaning fluids, uh, uh, all of those things, uh, uh, paints, um, the spray that uh, you may put on your Christmas tree to make it look like there's snow on it, um, any kind of product has been tested on animals, uh, essentially. It's been fed to animals. They've been poisoned with it um, to a point at which uh, certainly used to be the case, to a point at which half of them would die. Um, uh, in most cases, it's been put in the eyes of animals. Um, so there is a vast amount of testing that has caused a lot of suffering to animals where you could simply say, um, if we don't know that that product is safe and we can't find out whether it's safe with that, painfully testing on animals, we just don't need it, and we ought not to have it. Um, and then there's a lot of testing that goes on in uh, departments of psychology, for example, which I think has not been um, in any way life-saving or comparable to the examples that Ringark puts out. Uh, and as we'll see, there's even uh, research in ethology. So um, against that, you have to balance the benefits to human beings that have occurred from uh, research on animals, and uh, although, as Ringak says, there are some opponents of animal research who deny that there are such benefits, I think Ringak, on the whole, does a good job of demolishing that argument. Um, I think that you can't really deny that some research on animals has benefited humans. You can argue about how great the benefits have been and um, whether a lot of these benefits could have been achieved in other ways. For example, Wingard talks about the great increase in human longevity that has occurred over the past century or so. And uh, that's typical, typical of the argument of defenders of research on animals. But if you look at studies of what have been the real causes of uh, increase in longevity, um, a lot of them have been public health measures, things like um, Basically, clean water and sewerage uh, has been a huge factor in increasing longevity. And animal research had nothing to do with that. Another huge factor is um, essentially uh, better procedures at childbirth um, and caring for infants, which really has also not uh, been largely the result of, of animal research. It's been development of practices that have developed through human medical practice, and again, much better hygiene in these areas. But still, um, I'm not denying that some of that extent in increased human lifespan has been the result of animal research, and some of the reduction of pain and suffering has been the result of animal research. It's a counterfactual question whether we could have got some of these benefits by using the resources that went into animal research in other ways, um, either clinical research on humans with the consent of those taking part, or perhaps more recently developing uh, other tests uh, in uh, laboratories using tissues and cell cultures and so on. Um, but you know, it's, it's possible that Ringyak is right. It's possible that the benefits to humans outweigh the sufferings inflicted on animals, uh, and um, 
even, and that's true even if we give equal consideration to the interests of animals. Um, I'm not going to, I'm, I'm not really trying to deny that. I'm saying it's hard to know. But I also don't think it's the critical, relevant question for utilitarians or anyone else to be asking. Because what has happened has happened. We can't alter the past. What we really are interested in is what is going to be the future. And for that, we don't have to say, um, is the, the, the choice is between unrestricted research on animals or no research on animals. In fact, nobody really now advocates that um, because we do have committees that look at animal research and uh, that have some ethical guidelines. The question really is whether those ethical guidelines that they use are the right ones, whether they're strong enough or whether they're too weak, and whether we could have a better filter on which research is done on animals, better control on animal research, which would reduce the suffering of animals without significantly reducing the benefits to humans. And I think that that's uh, very likely to be the case because the guidelines to the committees that look at animal research do not instruct them to give equal consideration to the interests of animals. Um, they give them some concern, some, some guidelines to avoid unnecessary suffering to animals so they can go back to the experimenters and say, these animals are going to suffer in these ways. Tell us why that's necessary. But essentially, if the experimenter says, I cannot get the results I want without that suffering, the, committee, the committee's general guidelines seem to say, OK, then you have to approve the research. Um, you don't then weigh up what the gains are and what the costs to the animals are and say whether it's worth it or not. And that's it. that surely is what a, a utilitarian guideline that has equal consideration of interests ought to be saying. So let's briefly, in uh, closing, look at one example of this, uh, which comes from uh, uh, field ornithology studies. So um, it's an indication of the balance, not of important medical discoveries or benefits to humans to reduce suffering or uh, extend our lifespans, but it's rather to solve a scientific question, or at least to provide evidence relating to a scientific question, about the adaptive significance of infanticidal killing of conspecific young. So if you're not familiar with the, the, the background here, it's briefly mentioned in the article, but it's known in some cases that uh, infanticide occurs in uh, free-living animals. Um, and it seems to have adaptive significance. That is, it seems to, have, seems to occur when it has evolutionary benefits. So um, here's an example. Um, in uh, some primates, uh, the uh, reproduction arrangement is that there's a dominant male um, who has a number of females. <laughs> and uh, who breeds with those females. Uh, so the dominant male will get old after a while and will be challenged by another male for those females. And uh, in that challenge, often will lose, will be killed or driven away. And so the new dominant male takes over the, um, the females. In some species, what, what the dominant male does at that point is to take uh, infants who are being nursed by their mothers and kill them. Why does that happen? Not for the good of the species as a whole, of course, but um, that's not how evolution works. It's not work. What it is good for is it's good for the reproductive fitness of the new dominant male. Because if those females are uh, feeding and caring for those young, um, they're not going to be fertile. And uh, the dominant male, when mating with them, is not going to be able to have uh, offspring. So 
it's adaptive, that is, it uh, enhances the reproductive fitness of the male to kill the uh, infants that are being suckled by the mothers, um, so they will become fertile again, and that male will have more offspring. So that's why it's evolved. Um, and this study was to see whether this happens in a species of birds, jacanas, where, uh, in fact, the breeding situation, the male-female situation, is, is more or less reversed that the females are dominant and have harems of males. So what would happen if, um, you rem if, if the dominant female was removed, um, and, but instead of just observing this happening in a natural situation, where, as it has been observed with these primates and with some other species, the experimenters decided that the way to test this was to collect, as they say, but as the article makes clear, that's a euphemism for shooting, um, a couple of, uh, some of these uh, females uh, of this species called uh, the jacana. You see a photo over here, it's quite an uh, attractive bird, um, to see whether uh, the result is that a new female takes over and carries out infanticide uh, on the chicks for the same reason basically for the same adaptive reason. So that's what they did. They, uh, they shot a couple of females and they observed that the, uh, that sort of vacant territory, if you like, was rapidly taken over by a neighboring female and she did kill off the chicks of the female who had been shot. Uh, so, it's, it's, in the, it's in the journals because it was challenged by uh, a uh, biologist, Mark Beckoff, who thinks that this is, un this is unethical research. And um, uh, it's defended by the principal experimenter who carried it out. So, he's doing it on scientific grounds. There's no claim here that this is going to enhance human longevity or reduce human suffering. There's some claim that if we learn more about the way species behave, we'll be better able to conserve them if they're endangered. That seems pretty tenuous to me in these circumstances. I think, really, he's interested in broadening our scientific knowledge, in confirming a hypothesis about why infanticide occurs. The hypothesis seemed to me to be reasonably well established anyway. <laughs> but um, it's a case of do we justify uh, harming animals, causing suffering to animals by basic scientific knowledge or not.